Christmas today is what most people refer to as uh, Palm Sunday. Um, I know a lot of people are thinking about the cross this week, and um, especially with the Sunday school lessons about too. It's uh, about the death of Jesus Christ. And um, uh, if you have your Bibles, just turn to Romans chapter five. We'll look at a Bible there, or a verse there quickly. And of course, hopefully you brought your Bible because there's gonna be a lot of Bible in this uh, Sunday school lesson. So. Um, yeah, about the death of Jesus Christ. Uh, you're there in Romans chapter 5. One verse I want to look at here. It's a very common verse. All of you probably know it. And that is verse number 8. And it says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So, you know, we see from this very clear verse that, you know, Jesus Christ not only walked the earth, but, you know, he did die. And not only did he die, but he died for us. And, you know, if, if you think about the world... Um, the world started a little over 6,000 years ago, amen, and then, you know, all this time we've, we've, we see basically symbolism and prophecies of, of someone that would come in the future, and that person came, you know, Jesus Christ, and, you know, Jesus Christ did die, and, you know, this really is one of the most pivotal events of, you know, human history. Uh, you know, we think about these other events that have, have taken place. You know, sure, there have been some things that, you know, maybe especially here in America we talk about a lot. But, you know, there's, there's really one thing that the whole world understands, and that's, the, and that's the idea that, you know, Jesus Christ came to earth, he died, and then he resurrected three days later. And, you know, some people are obviously going to doubt whether or not that has any saving power. And, you know, what? That's, that's their free will. But um, the fact is, actually, most people do believe that Jesus Christ lived and that Jesus Christ died. And I want to start by actually showing an article I found um, on the internet. Um, and actually, it's not so much in, on the internet, but this was a scientific research article that was posted, or that was written and accepted in a peer-reviewed journal, the Journal of the American Medical Society. And if you know the American Medical Society, uh, these are not independent fundamental Baptists that, that run this thing, okay? Um, you know, these are just secular people that you know, since they're very, very big into science and stuff, they're, they're probably not, you know, conservative-minded Christians where they just believe the Bible and, and all those things. But, you know, I just have this article here. I'll, I'll put it over there if you want to see it later. But basically, you know, even, even sec the secular world will show that, you know, Jesus Christ did live. Uh, history shows us that Jesus Christ uh, was crucified and that, and that he did die. And, you know, there's, there's this theory going on, on that's been gaining popularity called swoon theory. And if you don't know what swoon theory is, it basically means that it's this philosophy that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. He, he basically, yeah, yeah, he just kind of fainted. And therefore, if Jesus didn't die, Jesus must not have resurrected. But here we have a, a secular news article where pe people go in deeply where they say, yeah, Jesus Christ definitely died. And all these doctors are supporting it and stuff. So I'll just leave, leave this over here because someone wants to look at it. But I just think it's cool that, you know, when you have people that, are probably by and large agnostics or atheists saying, yeah, Jesus Christ lived and he died. You know, that, 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 that's pretty powerful to me. So, you know, Jesus Christ did indeed die. And obviously the, the, the one Bible verse here is, is good enough for us, right? But um, it just, you know, the fact that there's even just this, all the secular stuff just shows it that much more. But anyway, if you want to turn to Genesis chapter 3, I want to talk a little bit about how the death of Jesus Christ is actually the subject of much symbolism in the Old Testament. So, you know, this isn't something that just happened randomly, but... You know, there is a symbolism that happens even thousands of years beforehand, which tells us that, you know, God is, God's at work here. If all the symbolism is happening beforehand, this isn't some just random event that occurred, but rather it's an it, it's a event in a series of planned events that God has. So there in Genesis chapter 3, we'll see basically the first reference to the gospel in verse 15, where it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So, you know, this is the first message about Jesus coming to die on the cross and to rise again. This is basically where Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, and God de decided, you know, this is where the fall of man is going to start. And basically, he says here that, you know, the seed of the woman, which is Jesus Christ, um, talks about how um, Satan will basically bruise his heel, basically um, will launch a series of events that will basically have Jesus Christ die on the cross. So there's the first reference to it. But it also says, you know, it shall bruise thy head, meaning eventually Satan's going to be cast into hell uh, for all eternity. And, you know, if you read the end of the Bible, Christians win. So that's, 
that's always good to see. But, you know, right here we see already a reference to Jesus dying on the cross. But um, I'm going to go through a couple more verses. You don't have to turn there because um, I, have, I have a lot to look at. But you also see offerings that take place in the Old Testament, which is also kind of a symbolism to the eternal offering. Uh, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In Genesis 8.20, the Bible says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. Genesis 22.13, we have Abraham. It says, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. So Abraham did burnt offering. Um, we, have, we have Manoah's offering in Judges, Judges 13. Uh, verse 16 says, And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. So Manoah took the kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously. And Manoah and his wife looked on. So, you know, we see these, we see these offerings in the Old Testament. They basically end up being symbolism for the great offering. Uh, Jesus Christ, who, you know, j just like everything in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ was a burnt offering that paid for our sins. And, you know, we'll talk, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But, uh, you know, the next thing that we talked about is that, obviously, Jesus had a prominent place in the Old Testament and all the symbolism referring to his death on the cross. But, you know, the death of Christ also has a prominent place in the New Testament. Uh, first off, if you just look at the Gospels, which detail Christ's life, a fifth of it is basically the last three days where he dies, and then three days later, he rises again. So if you think about it, if you extrapolate this out, if you had all three and a half years of his ministry as detailed in the Bible as those last three days were, the Gospels would have to be 8,400 pages long. <laughs> so obviously the Bible gives a lot of credence to the fact that um, the death of Christ is important, uh, the events that happened between his death and his resurrection are important, and his resurrection is important too, okay? So we see credence given to Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and we can also talk about the fact that, and my next point is this, the death of Christ is the chief purpose of his incarnation, okay? If you turn to Mark chapter 10, we'll look at an example of what the purpose of Jesus Christ coming to earth was. Mark 10 verse 45, the Bible reads, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So here's just one verse that mentions the fact that, you know, the purpose of the Son of Man coming was to give his life as a ransom for many. Um, so, you know, there's, a, 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 there's an alluding to the death of Christ. And also, you know, it, it shows the fact that it says he gave his life a ransom for many, not just a few people, as some people at like Calvinist would want to teach, but many. And also in other places it says all. So hopefully you understand what the word all means, you know, all who... Yeah, I mean, he died for all, and then obviously we have the choice of whether to accept or reject that. Okay, now if you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 2, we'll see another um, example of this. Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, verse 9, it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So there we go again, a... Uh, verse that talks about the purpose of Jesus Christ coming to earth. You know, Jesus was giving honor that by he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. And also there's just another fact that he says, you know, every man. Um, in case anyone tries to tell you that Jesus Christ didn't die for everybody and that somehow he only died for certain people and, you know, God, God predestined some people to go to heaven, some God predestined some people to go to hell, which isn't very loving if you think about it. Yeah. Um, you know, we see here that, you know, Jesus Christ did truly die for everybody, and it's, it, it, it's really our choice to whether uh, to accept that or reject his free gift of salvation. Turn a few pages to your right uh, to Hebrews chapter 9. We'll see one more verse on this, or actually I've one more verse after this, but Hebrews chapter 9 verse 26 says this, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So here again, Hebrews alludes to the fact that Jesus Christ came to earth to die on the cross. So, you know, what was the chief purpose of Christ coming? To basically die on the cross. And then, obviously, next week, Aaron will talk about what happens after that. Uh, turn to 1 John chapter 3. One more example we can look at here. 1 John 3. 
Verse 5, the Bible reads, And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. So, you know, it sometimes is nice to just see, you know, the, the loving nature of Jesus Christ. The fact that Jesus Christ knew no sin, but even in that sinless state that he was in, he decided basically to become sin for us and um, be manifested to take away our sins. And that's, that's awesome, okay? <laughs> so, you know, we think about it. Christ didn't come to earth just basically to teach us doctrine or just to kind of be an example, but he truly did come with the purpose of dying for the sins of the whole world. And we have to think about this is that his death was not an afterthought or an accident, uh, but it was something that was planned by God the Father. It was, it was one goal in a series of missions that God the Father had for Jesus Christ um, to basically um, fulfill the works of the Father, basically. And, you know, dying truly was one of them. And, you know, this week, this is what we, this is what we remember, the fact that Jesus Christ came to take away our sins. And just think about what, Christ, what separates Christianity from other religions. Um, you have Islam. You have a prophet, Muhammad, that basically lived um, to teach his followers certain doctrines, and then he died, and I, I guess that's it. Buddhism, what do you have? You have a prophet, Buddha, who basically lives and uh, teaches people doctrine, gets, gets a bunch of followers, and then he dies and basically gets forgotten about. Um, who else? Uh, you have, you know, who, who knows how many Hindu gods there are? Thousands probably, but, you know, we'll, we'll pick a name everybody knows. Krishna, right? Krishna lives, um, probably gains some followers, teaches some doctrine. People follow them for a while, and then Krishna dies or whatever. And then, I guess, you know, people forget about it or, or move on to some different god in Hinduism, I guess. But, you know, we think what separates Christianity is that Christianity is not just a man coming to the earth to teach doctrine and then just dissipate from the world and just disappear from everybody's mind. But he came and he died on the cross and he rose again. So, you know, anytime you run into someone that says, well, what makes Christianity different from other religions? Well, I think that's a great example is that Christianity, you have someone whose mission was to die on the cross and to take away our sins. And that, that, that is one particular thing that no one has an answer for when they try and, you know, say bad things about Christianity and make it look bad. They, 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 have nothing, they have nothing that they can say about that because, you know, that's, that's what happens when you're right, I guess. So, <laughs> so but uh, anyway, uh, yeah, the death of Christ was the chief purpose of his incarnation. Okay. Now, next point is this. Um, and the death of Christ is a, fen is, is a fundamental theme of the gospel and is something that should be emphasized out so many. If you want to turn to 1 Corinthians 15, again, what does the gospel mean? At its core, the word gospel means good news. And what's the good news? It's, the good news is that Jesus Christ, who was sinless, came to basically take away our sins and basically become sin for us, such that we don't have to pay for our own sins. Um, you know, Brother and I, Brother Dakota and I were out soul winning a, a lot this last month. And, you know, one thing, one thing I know Dakota always, always hammers is, um, especially, you know, we run into a lot of doors where, where people think they're going to heaven by turning from their sins or trying to live a good life. And, you know, Brother Dakota always says, well, have you turned from all your sins? I, I haven't turned from all my sins. If, if I had to pay for my own, well, I'd have to go to help to pay for that. And, you know, Dakota always says that very clearly. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful for that. And, you know, I, I try and do the same thing. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's good news that we don't have to pay for our own sins because Christ did it. And, you know, Christ died and, you know, Christ was forsaken of the Father. Um, and, you know, he, he did that for us. So, you know, this week definitely be thinking about that. You're there in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, we see here the definition of what the gospel is. In verse 1, the Bible reads, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and he was buried, and then he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So the gospel at its core, you know, the good news of Jesus Christ was that According to the scriptures, Jesus Christ came, died on the cross, shed his blood, rose again the third day. And simply by believing on that, you know, we're able to have everlasting life. And uh, the uh, w one who was sinless became sin for us. And, you know, I, 
I talk about it a lot, but you know, it's, it's, it's something that we definitely need to be reminded about on Palm Sunday. Um, you know, the death of Christ, I wrote here, is good news because it implies that we personally don't need to die for our own sins because, because Christ did it. And, you know, the Bible says in uh, John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. So, you know, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ died, so we don't have to. And, you know, if you think about it, if we just take a literal reading of what the gospel is in, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, you know, Jesus Christ said a whole bunch of other things in his earthly life, you know. He talked about the Mosaic Law, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, and all these, all these laws that were set up in the Old Testament. You know, the law might be our schoolmaster that leads us to salvation and makes us understand that we're a sinner, but ultimately it's, it's the gospel or the death, burial, and bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is saved. And, you know, there's, there's a popular... Um, evangelist. And what he's evangelizing is not the gospel. Um, you've all heard of him. His name is Ray Comfort. And if you if you go on the internet, you can watch his gospel presentations. And what you'll notice is he barely covers the cross. He barely covers the resurrection. But what he just spends almost all his time talking about is that someone's a sinner. You know, he'll go, he'll go on this long string of questions where he'll, he'll, he'll ask, have you ever lied before? Have you ever stolen before? Have you ever committed adultery before? And, you know, a lot of people probably will say yes to two or three of them. And then, you know, he'll just say to their face, so you're a, you're a lying, adulterous thief. And it's like, well, so, I mean, you're sure pointing out their sins, but, you know, where's the good news in that? I mean, probably, if anything, you're probably going to turn them away by, by making them feel like a piece of garbage, right? And, you know, one thing I notice about this is that if you watch these videos online, Ray Comfort, when he posts videos all the time, but the people never get saved, right. ever. And, you know, obviously the reason why is because the gospel isn't even being presented. Right. He spends maybe 5% of his time talking about Jesus at all, and the rest of the time it's just trying to get people to point out that they're sinners. And even after that, you know, Ray Comfort will even say, um, now that you're a sinner, to be saved you have to turn from your sins which is a false gospel. You know, the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. So, yeah, the death of Jesus Christ is good news because he died so we don't have to. And, you know, when we get even to heaven and we're at the judgment seat of Christ, you know, the Bible says, you know, Christ has separated our sins as far as the east is from the west. So, you know, people might say, do we have to answer for our sins? Well, no, because we're separated from them, right? So... <laughs> And then, yeah, so, you know, Christianity would, would be like other religions if, if uh, Christ didn't die. And, you know, we have, we have these religions that make their claim to fame basically off their founder. You know, we have Buddhism that goes after Buddha. You know, we have um, Islam that goes after the teachings of, of Muhammad and stuff. But, you know, if, if they died, and you, you can go to their graves in China, and you can go to their graves in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia or wherever, and, you know, they're... Their life is over because their, their death wasn't part of a series of um, pre-planned events that, that God had because their purpose wasn't to die. Their purpose was just to basically teach their own doctrine that, that wasn't based on anything that, that matters, really. So de definitely this week, definitely just be thinking about the fact that, you know, Jesus Christ died and, he was, and it was designed that he would die, okay? And, you know... Last point is this, you know, the death of Jesus Christ is essential to our salvation. Okay, you're in your Bibles, turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. It says in verse 14, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent, the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. So it says here that the Son of Man must be lifted up such that man can believe on him and have eternal life. So basically, if, if this didn't happen to the Son of Man, well, believing on him wouldn't mean anything because it says that for, for that to be able to even be a, be a thing, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Um, turn your Bibles to John 12. John chapter 12, verse 23, the Bible says, And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So Jesus talks about here about how death is a necessary part of bringing forth much fruit. And, you know, God doesn't pardon sin without death because that's outside his character, right? So, um, 
you know, that's, that's basically one of the reasons why Jesus Christ came to die is because that death basically provides the propitiation uh, that's necessary for our sins to be forgiven. He talks about that in 1 John 2, how he's the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Um, so, you know, it's so important. And as we read the first verse um, of the lesson today, Romans 5, 8, that, uh, you know, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Um, Christ paid the sinner's penalty. Um, turn to Galatians chapter 2 really quickly. Galatians chapter 2, verse 21, the Bible says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So, without the death of Jesus Christ, you know, no one's basically going to heaven because... Um, why is that? Because, you know, we'd have to go basically being judged by God based on how we lived our own life. And we all know we're not perfect. And because of that, we required someone who is perfect. And what's interesting is that even though Christ did die, you know, people will still say, well, you have to do, you still have to do something to be saved. You have to go to church. You have to, you have to be baptized. You have to turn from all your sins. Well, if, if that were true and Christ did, did die on the cross, well, that would be no different than if Christ didn't die on the cross at all. Right, because if we think it's still ha it's still our life, well, then God would have to judge us on our life, and at which point we'd fail, and you know Christ would have to die. Christ would basically die in vain. So, you know, it's essential to our salvation that that Christ died. It's not just something that happened, but it's something that God preplanned, and it's essential. And we're not righteous, so if if uh, we stood in front of God and God judged us, well, then we'd have to be the one that dies. But thankfully. We have a Savior, Jesus Christ, that we can praise all of our days. Amen. And, um, you know, talking about praising all of our days, the death of Jesus Christ is of supreme interest in heaven. Now, what's interesting about heaven is that those that are in heaven or those that have gone to heaven have a fuller and truer conception of life than we do. You know, they, they can really understand these things from a, a lens that we just can't see because we're limited by the flesh, right? right. Although, uh, although we're saved and we have the Spirit, the flesh is still there, and that you know it, it still limits us in some ways. Um, turn to Luke chapter nine, if you will, really quickly. Luke chapter nine. This is this is where where a meeting took place on the mountain of transfiguration. In uh, verse twenty-eight, the Bible reads, "And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering." And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. So here we even have Moses and Elias um, when, they, when they come and meet in spirit at the mountain of transfiguration. What are they talking about? They're talking about what Jesus Christ is going to do in the future at the cross. He's, you know, he's, he's going to come to Jerusalem. He's going to basically put himself into the hands, the hands of men and die on the cross. And that's, that's what they found important to talk about because... That was such a supreme interest in heaven. Uh, turn to Revelation chapter 5, this last place that, that, that we'll be turning. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible reads, and, we, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of, every, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor, and glory, and blessing. So we see here, obviously this is talking about a, uh, time, in, a time in heaven where we have basically the, the four and twenty elders basically bowing down before, before the Lamb, basically worshiping Him and saying, you know, thou art worthy to take this book and open the seals thereof, um, which will basically, you know, kick off some later events. And even, even angels are opening their mouths singing these, singing these songs and saying, hey, blessed is this lamb that was slain, and all the things that came afterward. And you know what? The death of Jesus Christ was, was not easy, but you know what? Jesus Christ says the rest of all eternity to, 
sit up at the right hand of the Father and receive our praise uh, for everlasting. So, you know, I guess I'm just happy that I'm, that I'm going to be there simply by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that's going to be exciting to be up in heaven and just continually thinking about the cross and the death of Jesus Christ um, for, for eternity. You know, so the death of Jesus Christ was so important. Obviously, it, it had its purpose. Jesus Christ didn't just come just to give his teachings and die, but he came with a supernatural reason to die on the cross, take our sins away. And uh, this week, definitely think about the death of Jesus Christ. And when we go out soul winning, always remember, talk about the death of Jesus Christ because it's, it's so important. Anyway, let's pray and we'll be done here. Dear Jesus, thank you for the, the Holy Bible. Thank you for the, the cross. Thank you for the death of Jesus Christ. And thank you for just uh, everything that Jesus Christ has done to uh, die for our sins such that we don't have to pay for our own sins. And we thank you for the, the gospel, the good news of salvation, that all we have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, like the Bible says, and uh, that, that because of that, we can have a home in heaven where we can just continue just to praise you all the day long. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.